Hello and welcome back to another video with It's Dr. Dan and today we're going to be learning about the properties of acids and bases. Now acids and bases are some of the most common chemicals that we use in not only in chemistry but also in biology. So this tends to be one of the more important types of chemicals that you learn about to prepare yourself, whether it's for chemistry, biology, um, chemical engineering, or in the health sciences, acids and bases are all around us, especially in our everyday life. So when it comes to acids and bases, the first thing that's all about is exactly how can we classify them. Now, it all started around in the late 1800s when a famous scientist named Arrhenius um, who was awarded the Nobel Prize back in 1903 um, for this, is that he was examining the properties of different aqueous solutions. So meaning different types of chemicals that were dissolved in water. And the one thing that he noticed was that acids, acids are substances that dissociate or break apart when they are in water. Now, when those things break, they tend to produce H plus in water, which is one of the most important parts. So being that it produces, it produces H plus, uh, that denotes an acid. And a base is something that dissociated and produced hydroxide or OH minus. Now, one of the things that you generally learn in your chemistry course is when you're naming acids, you're always looking for an H plus at the beginning of the formula. Whereas a base, you usually traditionally learn that you have an OH minus at the end. Now, being that we're talking about ions, well, this all relates to electrolytes. So all of these different acids and bases can be classified as electrolytes, both strong and weak electrolytes, because when they dissolve, they are ionized, meaning they can conduct electricity as a result, right? A lot of the batteries that you have in your different devices generally have acid-base characteristics. If you ever look at your car battery under your hood, you might notice that it says that it's cro that's very uh, corrosive on it, and then it might even say on in that inside of it there's sulfuric acid. Same thing if you ever have like a let's say a, a battery in the back of like a device, one of the removable ones, you might see that it might get battery acid on it, and that's telling you, hey, this is leaking out and that it is corroding. Now, when it comes to electrolytes, the whole idea is that. Essentially, what we are doing is we're taking something like, let's say, HCl, which is an acid, and if we are to, let's say, throw that into water, it will dissociate. So the way that we would write that is we would say, hey, we have HCl, this is aqueous, we would draw a dissociation reaction, just saying that they are breaking apart in water, and we are going to be making H+. Plus and Cl minus. And this is all going off of solubility rules when it comes to those different acids and bases. So being that it generated H plus that's being surrounded by waters, this tells you this made H plus that increased. So this is an acid based on the Arrhenius acid definition. Now from there, if I go to an Arrhenius base, for example, with sodium hydroxide, well, it's the same general idea. If I were to throw sodium hydroxide in water, well, what's going to happen is that it's going to dissociate or break into its individual ions, which are Na plus and OH minus, and they are both going to be aqueous as a result. They will be solvated by water, which will cause them to dissociate. And this is what we refer to when we talk about different electrolytes in solution. Let's take a look at some different types of chemical reactions that acids and bases are capable of doing and some other definitions behind this. Acids and bases are generally responsible for some of the most some of the most dangerous and some of the most beautiful reactions that we can see in science. Uh, many of them have to do by, with how you work biologically. Um, but one of the most common ones is neutralization, meaning that when you add an acid and you mix it with a base, the, uh, what is going to be happening is the hydrogen ion from the H plus from the acid from H plus and hydroxide OH minus from the base, they will combine and neutralize to form water. Now, the other part of the reaction is the cation and the anion in the reaction will make a salt. So every time you neutralize something, you make a salt and water. So if I were to, if I was going to be adding, let's say HCl or hydrochloric acid 
to sodium hydroxide. Well, what are we going to be making? We're going to make a water and salt because this is a double displacement reaction. Inside bonds with outside, right? The inside bonds together, making a salt or NaCl, right? Cation is always first. And then the outside bonds together, making H2O for water. So this is the way that we would then generally define an acid-base reaction. Now, this might be one specific ish, uh, illustration of this, but we can kind of follow the general definition for acids and bases, where you, it's common to see where we'll use, put an H out front to represent an acid. The X represents the anion or the negative ion that's connected to, and that's going to be reacting with a base that has a hydroxide component. We'll trade the different pieces to make water and salt as a product. So this is one of the major types of reactions when it comes to acid-base chemistry. Let's look at some more definitions. Definition was not a complete picture, right? H plus is generally the way that we do describe acids, especially when we work with the pH scale. However, it was a slightly incomplete. The thing about acids and bases is that they only explain different types of molecules that contain H plus and OH minus meaning this definition is very limited. There's other different types of acid, there's different types of bases specifically that don't follow this definition. So in order to explain this better in terms of solution, especially for a molecule like ammonia, which is one of the most common weak bases that we, that we are exposed to generally, um, it doesn't follow this definition. It doesn't donate a proton. However, what it can do is it can receive one. Right? It doesn't generate H plus or generate OH minus, but it can accept one. So what this definition instead of the other one, so two different definitions, so Arrhenius acid bases for increasing H plus and OH minus, the Bronsted Lowry definition is that an acid will donate a proton and a base will accept or receive that proton. So it's all about giving and receiving. So whenever we have an acid, right, it leads with H+. And what it's trying to do, it's kind of start trying to play catch and give that proton away. So whenever we have that, one thing to kind of remind ourselves is, well, what is H+. This is what we would call a proton. Now, why is that the case? Why do we call it a proton? Well, you got to think back to the base from a long time ago with regular basic chemistry. And it all had to do with, well, if you have a neutral hydrogen atom, it contained one proton and one electron, right? It's spot number one on the periodic table, meaning one proton, one electron. However, when it's H+, plus, that means it loses that one electron. So what is left? If it lost the one electron, the only thing left is that one single proton, and that's why we call an H plus a proton. So whenever we are talking about a Bronsted-Lowry acid, we talk, we refer to that as a proton donor, right? So it receive, or so it's donating that H plus, whereas a base is a proton acceptor, all right? So that's one of the common ways that we describe this. Let's look at some examples of trying to label proton donors and acceptors. So with all this, the whole idea to label an acid and a base is figuring out what will donate a proton, what will receive one. So the easiest way is to find the acid. Acids always have H leading the formula when it comes to that molecule. Um, so for example, I have hydrochloric acid. That is a strong acid. I always recommend memorizing your strong acids because it will save you on a lot of questions. So this one, what it's going to do is because this is our acid, it will donate its H plus to NH3 or ammonia. Ammonia is a base. Even though it has hydrogens on it, that does not make it automatically a acid. It has to have an acid at the beginning of the formula. So when that happens, well, what will be left of HCl if it loses its proton? Well, the only thing left is going to be Cl- remaining. And then on the other side, the NH3 is going to receive a proton and become NH4+. plus. So we always have a plus and a minus between these two different pieces. So the acid donated its proton to the base, and the base accepted one. Now, if we continue to look at this, so let's say if I do another one, 
Well, once again, we have HCl and water. Water is unique. Water can actually behave as either an acid or a base, completely depending on what is it reacting with? What is the strength of what it is reacting with? So if the other component like HCl is really strong, then at then the acid is going to be its acid, just like before. So HCl is our acid. So what it's going to do is it's going to donate its proton to water. So what's going to be left of HCl? Well, we got rid of an H plus. So the only thing left is Cl minus. And the reason it's Cl minus is being that we left an electron behind, that means chlorine has one extra electron. So it might kind of help to see how that entire Lewis structure looks like. So kind of reminding you of a really long time ago. So if we have, let's say, water and we have the structure of HCl, well, that proton is going to get transferred and put on to the other water. And as a result, it's going to have an extra, extra hydrogen. And then chlorine is going to have its negative charge. So we'll have chlorine and then H3O plus, which is known as hydronium. So this is the hydronium ion. And then we have the chloride ion. Okay, so that's our acid and our base. Let's look at one more. So right now I have ammonia and water. So ammonia is a very common base. So that is one thing you want to kind of keep in your head is that ammonia is typically a base. And like I said before, water can act as either an acid or a base. It depends on what it's interacting with. If the other component's a stronger acid, then water is a base. If the other component's a stronger base, then water is an acid. It gets a little confusing, but it will you'll come over time. So if water acts like an acid, it's going to donate its proton. So what is left? Well, the only thing remaining is going to be OH and O8, and it'll be a minus sign because we lost an H plus. On the other side, we're going to have NH4 plus or ammonium ion. So ammonium and hydroxide. So not only is this a, so if you kind of look at this one particularly, so this, as you saw, ammonia is a Bronsted-Lowry base or a Bronsted base. And you can also see that it produced hydroxide as a result. So it also could be defined as something that when it reacts with water, so water could be defined as something that could actually increase the OH minus concentration. So you can, we'll kind of see that the definitions will overlap. So a way to remember Bronsted base, acids and bases is I always kind of remember the little mnemonic bad, so with an extra A. So bases always accept, acids always donate. So ba bad, bases accept, acids donate when it comes to the protons is the easiest way to remember. Let's go on to our next part. So when it comes to the properties of acids and bases, which was the title of this video, it all comes down to what observations have we observed as chemists, as biologists over the course of hundreds of years. Well, the first part is when it comes to an acid is that they generally have a very sour taste. So one of the biggest examples that you probably have on a weekly basis is things that have citric acid in it. So if you have oranges, lemons, limes, or most soda products, um, like let's say Sprite or orange soda or anything that's like a fruitier flavor or lemon and lime, it generally has citric acid in it for that flavor component that you're used to. Especially if you like anything that has a sour, sour candy, it's a, usually it's covered with some citric acid to give that like that, that mouth pucker feel to it, just like the, the picture, this gif of this girl up here. Um, another thing is that a litmus paper, which is something that's commonly used in terms of uh, in biology and also in chemistry. So what litmus paper is, it's a paper that's coated with an indicator. And what an indicator is, is that it's a chemical that will change color at, at depending on essentially what it's reacting with. So this one particularly has a sensitivity to H plus or protons and hydroxide concentrations. So if you have blue litmus paper and you dip it in an acid, it's actually going to cause it to turn red as a result. So you'll see a color change happen. Um, what other properties that there are that are really common too, is that typically when it comes to acids, they will react with different metals to create hydrogen gas. One of the common experiments that we do in, in our own course is that we take 
um, magnesium reacted with HCl, and then we collect hydrogen in a really big glass collection tube. Um, we also did an experiment where if you take zinc and you react it with HCl, and then we collected the hydrogen gas in a test tube and we lit it on fire and it makes a pop sound, right? They all make hydrogen. Now, another one is that being that it, it acids and bases, right? They are electrolytes. They will conduct electricity in solutions. And this is why how your, a lot of your car batteries function is that they will have battery acid inside of them to help them work. Um, the other big thing that happens as well is that they react with a lot of carbonates and bicarbonates to produce CO2. So one of the big things that's in soda is that you'll see that they're on the ingredients, there's carbonic acid. Well, what carbonic acid does is it's a gas evolution chemical. So it will actually break down into water and CO2, which is where all that fizz and bubbles come from, from carbonated beverages. Let's look at the properties of bases. So with the properties of bases, these ones are tend to be very bitter. They're, they have a soapy feeling to them, meaning that they're slippery. They can even are described as tasting soapy or chalky. Um, one example of that chalky taste is if you ever have a Tums, which is an anti-acid or an acid, that will react with uh, essentially an acid, neutralize it when if you have a really upset stomach, but they usually taste chalky. Um, other one, other things is that they change color of the litmus paper as well. So if you take, uh, let's say, a red piece of litmus paper, so there's two colors, and you dip it into a base, it will change blue. Um, the other thing is that they typically feel very slippery. Now, keep in mind with acids and bases, you don't want to start tasting all these different chemicals, right? That was something they did in the early in the 1800s and 1900s, and most of them didn't really last super long afterwards. That's not a safe thing to do. Um, but if you do get some on your skin, you feel it's all of a sudden really slippery on your skin, wash your hands for, for as long as to get those chemicals off to keep yourself safe. And then the last thing is they also conduct electricity because they are electrolytes, right? So a strong electrolyte will conduct a lot of electricity, um, whereas a weak electrolyte, not so much because it does not dissociate fully. Let's look at all of our definitions. So when it comes to acids and bases, there are three major definitions. We went over two of them in this video. The first one is the Arrhenius acid and base. This, this is essentially your, your bare bones, basic idea of how to describe an acid and base. This is usually what we use to describe the pH or the pOH of different solutions, something you'll learn about in other videos. So whenever you have an Arrhenius acid, it increases the proton concentration. When you have an Arrhenius base, it increases the hydroxide concentration as a result. When it comes to, let's say, the bronsted lowry definition, what's happening is that the acid is going to be donating its H plus or its proton to the base. So you're going to see that getting traded, right, from one to the other. The last one, which is not in this video, but is very common in organic chemistry, and it's something to be aware of if you do have to go into Chem 1A, 1B, and organic, or if you're even in some of the biological sciences, you might see them, is that there's another one called Lewis acids and bases, named after the same scientists that did Lewis diagrams. So the whole idea here is that essentially it's all about electrons moving. So a base typically donates electrons and acid receives electrons. But this is not in my course for introductory chemistry. But I did want you to know about the definition in case you come across it in any of the materials that you read about or study. All right, so these are your three definitions in terms of acids and bases. You do have to understand the idea of Arrhenius acids and bases and the bronsted Lowry acids and bases. Thank you so much for listening. I hope that this video helped you. And if you have any questions, please reach out to me and ask for help. Um, if you uh, are just watching this video as another student and you need help, please comment below and let me know if there's anything I can do. Uh, and if this is also your first time you're just watching, then please like, subscribe, comment, please, and anything else, just let me know. I am here for you. And if you have suggestions for future videos, let me know. I'll try to make them for you. All right. Have a wonderful day and I'll see you all later. Bye now.